Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. A quick note about the foundation. We've started on our massive literature review of all the potential treatments for anxiety and depression. Uh, The whole premise here is that if you go to a practitioner, uh, they will likely know, let's say, 2 to 3% of all the possible treatments for anxiety and depression and related disorders. What if we're able to look at, you know, thousands of sources and compile, let's say, 20% of all the possible treatments out there? If so, it would be a boon, I think, to people suffering and people that know them. So to find out more, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org. And today, my guest is uh, Alex Korb, PhD. He's a neuroscientist, a writer, and a coach. Uh, He studied the brain for over 20 years. He's the best-selling author of The Upward Spiral, using neuroscience to reverse the course of depression, one small change at a time. So Alex, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, tell me about your, your background. What got you into neuroscience and then what led to you, you know, writing the book and doing your, the work that you do? Yeah, well, I've always been fascinated by the brain. I think I realized just what makes different people different from each other. And then I took a neuroscience class in college just because like, oh, this seems interesting. And just the more I learned, the more fascinated I became, even just from simple aspects of how neurons, you know, brain cells work and, you know, use electrical impulses and chemicals and uh, how, you know, our senses work, just even how, you know, the brain processes the visual world. But what really started to fascinate me more and more is about how the brain regulates our emotional experience of the world. And that wasn't just interesting or fascinating like the other elements of neuroscience. That to me seemed like something that was really important to understand something that could really help people to understand why we, you know, get stuck in bad habits and do things we don't want to do. Or uh, why our brain sometimes, you know, focuses so much on the negative or why we get stuck in, you know, a loop of worry and anxiety or mired in depression. And these are the kinds of questions that led me to want to get a PhD in neuroscience so that I could um, try and understand the brain better and better help people. So you're looking at it from a purely like neurological or biological basis, or um, is there psychology and psychiatry mixed in any work? Yeah, my mom is a psychiatrist and actually a psychoanalyst. Uh, So I have always thought about 
the, you know, the psychological aspects of our well-being. I just remember like in third grade, like I couldn't get long division and I started crying. <laughs> and my mom said like, oh, you must be feeling really overwhelmed. And that it was like, it struck me it's and stuck in my memory as like this notion like, oh, like why, like, why am I crying? I'm not sad that just this notion that like, oh, emotions that you're not really aware of can impact, you know, your feelings and impact your focus and get in the way and just being able to acknowledge them uh, sometimes makes them go away. And so I've always sort of been aware of elements of that. And she actually was the first person I knew who was interested in neuroscience. She joined with a few other psychiatrists uh, and other uh, people around her to have a neuroscience club. <laughs> and they just read journal articles occasionally. And I just sort of found out about the second hand because she would mention something that was really interesting about the brain. And Dan Siegel, who's a, uh, a popular psychologist, and writes a lot about neuroscientists, neuroscience. He was in that group. And she actually wrote a few articles about how what she was learning about neuroscience related to psychoanalysis and how, how that could inform the, you know, the practice of talk therapy. So that was actually something that was in my awareness very early on in, in terms of, in terms of depression and neuroscience. And it's interesting. I remember I took a class in college uh, on abnormal psychology. And I remember learning about the different types of therapy. And the most common type that's used in psychological research is cognitive behavioral therapy, where, oh, they target people's, uh, you know, incorrect beliefs or uh, inaccurate perceptions, and, you know, change their actions and how that can affect your emotions. And that seemed very reasonable to me. And then the professor sort of talked about this other approach called the psychodynamic approach um, that he was sort of a little dismissive of because it wasn't as scientifically rigorous. Uh, but he sort of described it as like, well, getting to the bottom of or understanding where these emotions come from in the first place. And that always struck me as eminently reasonable. <laughs> like, yeah, if you keep... Okay. Finding yourself. So what, what's your angle on it though? Like, what are you in particular trying to figure out? Is it more broad or are there specifics that you're focusing on? Well, I am. Um, uh, it's basically incorporating all of those things in, in grad school. I was trying to figure out what is wrong with the brain depression. Like there's got to be something we can measure that would tell you oh, what's wrong if you have depression or not, or what medication you should get. Uh, and it turns out mm, that's not really the case in that, at, at least in that straightforward sense. And what led me to write my book, The Upward Spiral, was just reading all this different research about that we often think that there are just a few ways to change the brain's activity and chemistry, like taking antidepressant medications or um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is you stimulate the brain using magnets. But what I found uh, from all this great research that other people had done was that there are actually so many ways to change the brain's activity and chemistry that don't involve high-tech interventions developed in a lab. Simple things like exercise or gratitude or changing your sleep patterns and also things like psychotherapy. And various forms of psychotherapy sort of work in different ways. You can try and get people to understand their own thoughts and get in touch with, you know, the sort of subconscious biases and where these thoughts originated from trauma in their past. Uh, you can also take a more cognitive behavioral approach of getting people to understand, you know, when their thoughts are inaccurate and it doesn't really matter where they're coming from. All you have to do is recognize sort of in the present moment, like, oh, this isn't helpful or that's not true. And what I found is that in pretty much every approach of someone who's trying to 
treat depression, they had their narrow slice and that they were like, oh, mindfulness, that's the answer or medication, that's the answer or whatever. And they would just talk about how this is, you know, the way to treat depression. And what I have came to understand from the neuroscience is that there is no one correct way to treat depression. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. There are just dozens of different interventions that research has shown us to be generally helpful for people with depression. What science can't tell you is exactly which specific treatment is definitely going to work for you, you know, right now. And that's why I really wanted to write uh, The Upward Spiral to help people understand their own brains better to understand why they got stuck and to really see the whole menu of options that was available to them and to connect all of those things to the underlying neuroscience. Because if you're interested in the brain, you're like, Oh, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a scientifically minded person. You're probably going to be drawn to things like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac or Zoloft or high tech interventions like, as I said before, transcranial magnetic stimulation, because those sound really sciencey and it's very clear that those are impacting the brain. What is less clear for most people is they don't realize how real world life changes, just like taking deep breath or hanging out with your friends or getting some sunlight or just getting some exercise that these sort of low tech, simple life changes can actually uh, change the activity and chemistry of key brain circuits that contribute to depression and um, anxiety and stress. And that these low tech interventions can often uh, modulate the brain in more targeted and nuanced ways uh, than the sort of traditional psychiatric treatments for depression. What's your heuristic then if someone is uh, going through anxiety or depression? Like, how do you characterize where they're at? How do you show them the tools to help themselves? And how do you tailor it to their situation at that moment? Well, I think the the first part is helping them understand a, a little bit about the neuroscience in the first place. Uh, that's where I often come back to because uh, I find that many people want to, you know, they have a problem and they're just like, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And this, I feel like is also a particularly like Silicon Valley type approach to it. Like, okay, let's not, you know, focus on the past or the problem. Okay. Let's just, you know, take action and pivot and refocus. And, and that's the framework that most people are coming into it with, but that sort of creates this like almost pathological need to be happy all the time. Your people are like running away from their depression. They're running away uh, from their anxiety. Whereas when you start to understand the brain, you start to see that like, oh, a lot of these things, all these elements of depression, a lot of elements of anxiety are just a part of what it means to have a human brain. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. And that even if you got over your depression, even if you moved past your anxiety, there would still be times when life feels pointless or there'll still be times when you feel overwhelmed. There's nothing wrong with these feelings per se. And 
having that understanding of it makes you realize that, oh, these are just tools. I might be stuck in a bad habit where I'm overutilizing certain tools, but there's nothing wrong with the brain per se. There's nothing wrong with me per se. And starting from that point makes it much easier to move forward and get better. And once you understand like, oh, there's nothing wrong with you, then you can start to clarify, oh, okay, what's important to me and how are certain elements of my depression or anxiety actually helping me move towards what's important to me and how are they getting in the way? And that uh, is sometimes difficult, by the way, to, to understand about what actually is important to you when you're overwhelmed by depression. And so a lot of times it's just in the start, uh, it's about just taking some helpful actions, just taking some deep breaths, starting to change your sleep patterns, starting to um, get some more physical activity, starting to move forward. And that actually changes the brain's activity and chemistry in ways that make it easier to manage your emotions, to start to clarify what's important to you. And that's why I call it the upward spiral, because it's not just a straight forward path. You make one little small change, and then that makes the brain change, which makes it easier to make the next change. But you're not just following a recipe of someone telling you do this, this, and this. You are you have a menu of options that you're like, okay, I'm going to try try this, see how it works. Oh, it helped a little bit. Okay, either do more, try something else. That's a much more holistic approach. Well, you said that people think something's wrong with them. So what's a dividing line? If you feel a certain way, is that okay? Is that normal? Or is there a problem? Like, how do you know which thoughts and feelings that seem wrong to you or seem bad are truly bad or hurtful and which ones are not? Well, you can't. It is, I think that is a, um, uh, that the way of viewing depression that most people have and that is supported, you know, by how we treat depression generally, uh, not not supported in the evidence, but in supported by just like societally, that's how we view it. That like, oh, there are certain things that are good and certain things that are bad. Um, but that's an unhelpful way of viewing it because there is no clear boundary that you can draw. The uh, we when studying depression, okay, you have to have some criteria to you know rate different symptoms and. You know, if you want to let people into the study or not into the study, you sort of have to have a, um, a way to define that. But, and that's what the DSM uh, has attempted to do. Or if you're trying to get reimbursed as a psychiatrist from the, from insurance companies, you have to have some way to diagnose, oh, okay, you technically have depression or you don't. But the brain, the biology of it doesn't make this right line distinction between like, oh, you have depression and these are unhelpful thoughts uh, versus, oh, you don't have depression, you're totally fine. And so what it means to overcome depression is sort of inextricably linked with, well, what does it mean to be happy and lead a fulfilling life? If someone is really, you know, stressed and frustrated and anxious about, say, the idea of writing a novel, are those bad thoughts? Should they just, oh, stop trying to write a novel and then they'll feel better? Maybe, maybe not. Like, no, but I'm, I'm so talking about like, uh, I don't know, you, you know someone and you seem to get into fights with them a lot lately and you just, anything they say like puts you on edge and you know, maybe a situation like that, that's maybe not as clear cut, you know, right. or... You're, you're so sad that you go into work, you have to like go in the bathroom sometimes because you want to cry or it's hard right. for you to talk to certain people because you're just, you're not in control of your emotions. You know, what, what about those scenarios? Right. Well, there are, I would say that's actually what you're describing is more clear cut, like where you're, where it's clear to you that, oh, my emotions are totally overwhelming me or they're completely getting in the way of the things that are important to me. Then. Yeah, like you should go talk to a mental health professional. You should do probably do something about that. 
the, uh, but the, what doesn't necessarily matter is a lot of times people are like, well, well, do I have depression or, you know, do I have, you know, do I have clinical depression or do I have clinical anxiety? And, uh, you know, sometimes people, you know, they have a lot of issues. They feel overwhelmed by their emotions, but they don't technically meet the criteria for clinical depression. That doesn't mean there's nothing wrong with you. Like the, what my point is that there's, I, I think sometimes people are too over obsessed with whether they technically meet certain criteria for clinical depression. And what matters is like most is your experience of your life. Do you feel like your emotions are getting in the way of things that are really important to you? Uh, okay. Well, then you could do something about it and maybe antidepressant medications would be helpful. Maybe exercise would be helpful. Maybe social interaction would be helpful. But if you find that anxiety or your emotions in general are getting in the way of things that are important to you, then you should absolutely go and talk to a professional about it. And you don't, my, my point is that you don't need to wait until you're totally completely depressed and, and absolutely certain that you're depressed before you start to do something about it. There's no reason why uh, you need to let it, you know, go into, you know, as far as possible before starting to think about what you could possibly do. But does that mean you're, you're dealing with people that are kind of, they're not even sure that they're having a significant problem? I mean, what, at what level are you focusing on the problem? Because I, I gave you a couple examples and they sound more serious than the level that, I'm not trying to say the other ones aren't serious, but oh, yeah, it yeah. seems like they're, they're deeper and they need maybe significant help. And the ones you're describing, like, it kind of sounds like, I guess, midlife crisis, quarter life crisis, like, Things that are uncertain mentally as if they're truly good or bad or just no big deal. Right. Well, my point is that it, there's not as much of a need to make a big uh, distinction. What it really comes down to is essentially two things, is understanding for yourself what is more important to you and what is less important to you and what you have control over and what you don't have control over. There are people who have experienced significant trauma in their lives. And that's one of the contributing factors to their depression. You don't have control, however, over your past experiences. All you have control over is your awareness of it in the present moment and maybe what you choose to reframe about that. Uh, but that might be a contributing factor to your depression. Your job might also be a contributing factor, a toxic work environment, uh, for example, or a relationship or losing your job. Uh, these are all things that are in some instances, yeah, just like a midlife crisis. Like, oh, you, oh yeah, you're just feeling kind of down because you're not really sure if you should switch careers or not. But someone could have depression and that question of should you switch careers or not doesn't suddenly become irrelevant just because they have depression. But I think that is a lot of the way that many people view depression. They're like, ah, well, now that I'm depressed, okay, forget about all this, you know, finding a better job or finding a more supportive partner. I just need to go take medication. And that's where I say it's not helpful. Like, yeah, maybe medication is part of the answer. For 40% of people with depression, they could just take a pill and their depression, they'll, you know, a few weeks later, their depression is completely gone. But what if you're one of the other 60% of people with depression? You could take medication and it's either just going to help a little or not going to really help much at all. Should you change jobs? Well, is your toxic, are you in a toxic work environment? Is that contributing to your depression? If yes, you're in a toxic work environment, then try changing your job. Maybe that will alleviate your depression or it might not alleviate it completely, but it will probably help. So and you mean where... people, are, people are looking for an easy fix. They're looking for an off the shelf prescribed pill to just get them over what probably normally just needs to be like a self-assessment. And yeah, you know, people right, are oh, looking this is upset me and then I'll, I'll stop. People are looking both for an easy fix 
and for a simple, straightforward answer. Because like a, a medication, the reason why medication is so appealing is because it's both easy and straightforward. People are like, oh, here's the one answer. Just take a pill and you're good. And it's very alluring because for 40% or so of people with depression, it is the answer. And this is what I went into grad school to, to figure out. It's like, well, there's got to be something we could measure about the brain that would tell us like, oh, you should, be, you should take medication because you have this brain pattern. And you, oh, you should, do, you should go to talk therapy. Uh, but it's not clear cut like that. Things like psychotherapy, that is not uh, an easy, quick answer, but it is straightforward uh, because you're like, okay, well, all I have to do is go, you know, meet with this person, you know, once a week for, you know, three months or four months or something and blah, blah, blah. Like it'll, it'll help. What I've found is that almost everyone who does research or treatment, they're just talking about they're one thing and they're like, oh, medication. Oh, that's the best thing. Or like psychotherapy. Oh, that's the best thing. Or like meditation, you know, do this mindfulness program. That's going to treat everything. And what I found is like, there is no one big solution for depression. Stop looking for the one thing that's going to solve all of your problems. There are many contributing factors that are pushing you down into a downward spiral. And for the thing, for the elements of that, that you can't control, like trauma that you experienced as a child that may have, you know, affected your neural circuits, but you can't go back in time and change that for things that you can't control. The only useful path forward is acceptance. And for things that you can control, the most useful path forward is to do something about it. Uh, and so understanding the neuroscience helps you sort that out. Because you start to understand, oh, which parts of my biology aren't changeable? Like they're just part of having a human brain. I think there are some things that people experience about themselves that they find very frustrating. They're focused on the negative, their, you know, their anxiety, you know, bad habits that are just part of what it means to have a human brain. And the sooner that you recognize that, the sooner you can stop blaming yourself for being stuck in these things. They are just... You can't change those things. That frees you. Once you accept the things that you can't change about your brain, then it frees you up to focus on, oh, what are all the little knobs that I can fiddle with that will change the activity and chemistry of my, um, you know, emotion circuits or my habit circuits? And antidepressant medications are certainly one way to do that. But many scientifically minded people think that, oh, that's the only way to do that. I think of it as like, oh, it could be part of your path forward out of depression, but it might not be. Uh, and so if you're totally stuck and you have no idea what to do, then taking medication, sure, that's a great first step. And if it solves all of your problems, great. But if it doesn't solve all your problems, okay, well, you could try exercise or changing your sleep patterns or social interaction. Uh, or if you, you know, are really sensitive to medication and you have really bad side effects and you don't want to try medication, that's fine. You could just jump right into these life changes as well. And for some people, just making a bunch of different life changes, like finding a better relationship and changing their job, that will be enough to get them out of their depression. And that doesn't mean their depression wasn't real. It doesn't mean their depression wasn't biological. It's just that these life changes that they made had effects on their brain biology and chemistry that reversed the course of their depression. Other people, it's going to require, you know, medication, but that, that doesn't mean that like for the person who takes medication, that, that, that their depression is somehow more real than someone else, or that if changing your thoughts or, or practicing gratitude if that helps you, that doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're just faking it, uh, nor does it mean, by the way, that you can just always think your way out of depression. Uh, and so it's a nuanced argument that people want to frame everything in terms of black and white. Either there's, you know, this is the answer or it's not helpful at all, or either it's totally biological 
or it's all in your head. And it, the truth is that your biology and your psychology and your social interactions and your environment all interact. So has this inspired you to come up with a heuristic? Like, what if you were to do, I don't know, a quiz or maybe you do this in the book. I don't know. I haven't gone through it yet. Um, do you have like an assessment so that people can know where they are? And then do you give kind of three or four different heuristics on what you'd suggest based on where they're at mentally? Would that be a solution? Yeah, it's it's hard to create a sort of menu for it because um, just in the same way that you can't create a certain amount of menu, a recipe, you can't create a recipe for how to be happy. It's essentially the same question. Like I can give you a general guideline of like, well, you know, you should probably hang out with your friends. You should probably do, you know, activities that you like. You should probably be physically active, but like how much exactly is going to be different for different people because they have different biology and they have different values and they have different circumstances. And so for something as like one of the most simplest uh, interventions is like physical activity. So uh, physical activity, I can tell you how research has shown, you know, that exercise can change all these key uh, chemicals in the brain, like serotonin and dopamine. Uh, and if you're someone who is sitting on a couch all day, then I could say, ah, yeah, well, then probably if you, you know, get a little more movement, go for a walk around the block, uh, maybe get a little more exercise, that's, you're certainly going to benefit from that. Uh, if you're someone who, you know, oh, you walk occasionally, but you don't ever really push yourself. Okay. Well, then you could probably also benefit from a little more exercise. Where exactly the line is though is going to be different for different people because some people, they are, you know, they're born athletes. And if they just, you know, went for a run every day, they wouldn't have a problem. Uh, other people, they might push themselves and exercise too much uh, and they're stressing themselves out. And so a lot of this is about realizing, oh, there are different, all these different things that impact your brain activity and chemistry. And if you are all the way, you know, on one end of the spectrum in any of these categories, well, that's probably something you should try changing or fiddling with until you find the right balance that's good for you. But most people, they don't want to engage in this practice of understand uh, uh, this experiment of understanding themselves better and trying different things to figure out how to balance their brain. They just want to be told the answer. And that in I itself think a, is sometimes a problem. Well, I, don't, I don't know if everyone wants to be told, but I mean, I think there's, yeah. So, I mean, there's a bunch of complication there, right? Some people just want to be told and they just want a pill and don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sure no one wants to, it's ugly. You know, who wants to go and think through why am I feeling this way? Why am I acting this way? And, and think mm -hmm. through their emotions and all that and try to help themselves. And again, there's the shame associated with it and just on right. and on and on. So I can see that it's, I don't know, also too, like when you have a practitioner tell you, well, try this, then try that, then try this. And everyone's different. It, it gives the feeling, at least to me, of like, well, does the person really know? So they're saying, ah, try this, try that. And the same people right. that want, want to be told what to do want that certainty, too, from whatever practitioner. Right. And that's why, by the way, I talk if, about... If they don't get it, where does that leave them? You know? Right. And that's why I talk about the neuroscience. Uh, the neuroscience is not as satisfying as you would like, uh, but it is what it is. And our, your own desire for certainty, that is something for many people that gets in the way. Wanting to have certainty and clarity, there's nothing wrong with that. That is a very helpful attitude to have most of the time. It's just like wanting to be successful and do things 
write and make lots of money. Like those are, there's nothing inherently wrong with those attitudes. They're often very good. (laughs) They're what help people be successful. And yet sometimes in an uncertain world, and certainly when you get to biology, which is complex and uncertain, your desire for certainty is one of the things that is getting in the way. And if your desire for certainty helps you, you know, you think through all of your options and you oh, you come up with a plan and it helps you take action, great. Then it is a useful tool at that moment. But if your desire for certainty just makes you keep spinning your wheels and thinking about all these things that, well, I would do that if I knew for certain it would help. And if I knew that would help for certain, then I would do that. And it just keeps you paralyzed. Well, then the thing that you need to work on is tolerating uncertainty better and taking action in the face of uncertainty. And I can't tell you ahead of time, and no one can tell you ahead of time, which of these things is the primary cause of your depression. But if you are unable to tolerate certainty and you are not getting any physical activity and you're sleeping terribly and you never hang out within your friends and you hate your job, well, there's good news there that I can't tell you which of those things is the primary cause for your depression, but I can tell you that if you change any of those things, you will start to create an upward spiral and be better off than you were before. And once you start to make one small change, then you can make another change. And the per- is up to the person. You can decide. This is the good news. You're, you're saying it's like, well, someone doesn't want to experiment on that. Well, I think people also don't want to be bullshitted. They don't want someone to tell them, hey, this is the answer when the science doesn't really actually know it. So I'm saying what the science is really supporting, which is good news, is that there is no one path, but there are many paths that you can try. And if you try one thing and it doesn't solve everything, that's fine. That's expected. As long as it's better than the default of what you're doing before, then you're headed in the right direction. Very good. Well, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and get your book? Where can they go? Yeah. Uh, well, the, uh, the book is available everywhere. You know, I hate sending people to Amazon, but that's always the best place. Uh, I find the easiest place for me to buy books. But uh, yeah, the Upward Spiral is actually available also, you know, at pretty much anywhere you buy books. And it's available in like 12 different languages. Now it's in Korean and Chinese and German and Dutch and Polish and Spanish. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I also created a workbook, the Upward Spiral Workbook, uh, you know, not a creative name, uh, to help people put some of these things more into action. Because the, the original book, The Upward Spiral, is about 80% understanding your brain and how it works. And 20%, okay, here are things to try to, you know, change it. The workbook sort of has the complementary emphasis because some people do want a little bit more, you know, specific guidance. Like, okay, how much exercise should I get? How should I start exercising? How should I change my sleep patterns? And so on. And so, yeah, one of those books is great. And you can also find me at alexcorbphd.com. I have a blog and a mailing list, and I'm trying to create some more videos and courses that are helpful for people. So those are the best ways. And I guess social media, I'm on Twitter at prefrontal blog, and I'm on Instagram at the upward spiral coach. So any of those ways people can connect with me. Okay. Very good. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.